We have a sterling silver beer jug, passed out through generations as a cherished family heirloom. It was originally gifted to the guest mother for her 70th birthday and was passed down from one generation to another. It had been given to her for her 70th birthday, that was about 1990, by a very good old friend of hers who loved it. And she gifted it to my mother and my mother gifted it to me. It was made by the Gorham Company in Providence, Rhode Island, known for making silver plate and sterling. Take a closer look at it. You can identify its naturalistic hops adorning its body, handle, and foot. As good a piece of American silver as you'll ever see. And we can see the name on the bottom. The little anchor in the center there is the mark of Gorham. This is of top quality, with every detail chased and hammered by craftsmen. It embodies the pinnacle of American silver craftsmanship. Acknowledging its age and craftsmanship, this historic piece is valued at $7,500. Oh, wow. We'll uncover the true worth of this map, which the guest underestimated. A lot of people don't know Providence, so I'm assuming it's not worth as much as if it was Boston or New York or, uh -huh. a, you know, a more popular city. I'm thinking maybe $1,000, mm -hmm. maybe. Guest has this old map of Providence, Rhode Island from 1857. She grew up in Rhode Island and found this while cleaning out her parents' house. This is a monumental wall map printed in New York and unusually large for its era. Made by Henry Francis Walling, who was a native of Rhode Island, it's printed as a lithograph on linen. The map shows Providence in 1857 with projections of future growth. It is surrounded by smaller views of important buildings, hand-colored for detail. Best way to preserve it is to keep it folded. Given how rare it is, it's worth closer to... An auction estimate would be, at this day and age, about three to $4,000. Oh, wow. Very nice. That's nice. The guest inherited a drawing and a photograph of Charlie Chaplin from her mother, who had a memorable encounter with Chaplin in 1923. Three and a half years old, staying at a hotel, and Mr. Chaplin was there as well. Charlie Chaplin came from England to America to be a star. Chaplin's rise to stardom, founding of the United Artists Studio, and influence on Hollywood's golden age are highlighted in the drawing. The picture is the character of Charlie in The Little Tramp. Charlie inscribed it to her, though people like to buy things that are signed. The picture would be between fifteen and $2,500, while the drawing is worth twenty five and $3,500. Very nice. Thank you. Take a good look at this incredibly delightful chest. The guest uses it to hold socks and a junk chest now. But this piece dates back to the early 18th century around 1710 to 1720, with a likely Dutch origin due to its continental feel. The shape of the top followed through with the front and this lovely color. It's fascinating. The heavily curled veneer of walnut, divided and opened up like a butterfly's wing, is remarkable. These handles are new. They're about 1890 to 1900. Right. Whereas these are the original escutcheons. Okay. Now, they used exactly the same metalware in Holland as they did in England and in France at this time. At the top, the little bun feet were replaced with taller ones. There's also a new rail that wasn't part of the original design. The current value of this piece is eight to 10,000 pounds. It's quite surprising, isn't it? All right. As everyone says, that is surprising. <laughs> The guest explains that the silver pieces belong to her mother, who was an apprentice at age 16 for George Jensen, the renowned Danish silversmith, for five years. The collection includes her mother's apprentice piece, certificate of completion, drawings. Apprenticeship and recommending her and praising her for her hard work and certifying that she would be a... Line drawings of the grapevine patterned piece, a covered vegetable bowl, show the correct markings for 1933, her graduation year, with her own drawings to assist in making the piece. The appraiser discusses a letter from George Jensen certifying her completion of apprenticeship and praising her work, along with a book on the history of the George Jensen firm featuring a picture of the workshop with her mother in it. The silver pieces include a necklace made in 1932 before her apprenticeship completion, marked with her initials and the date and a bracelet and necklace made later, marked with her married initials. The appraiser explains the history and significance of the George Jensen firm, noting that the pattern on the covered vegetable bowl, 408, 
came out around 1925 and this pattern came out around 1925 right. this is the 408 and it came in a variety of sizes mm -hmm. the appraiser estimates the whole collection to be valued at so we would assume that there's for sure collectors out there worldwide right. that somewhere in the 30 to 35 thousand dollar range your entire collection would be able to be we have a series of paintings by Bob Ross. The guests got them from their parents who bought them in the 70s. A Quonset hut sale. <laughs> Salvation Army. It was a Christmas gift to my parents in the, in the 1970s. They were all acquired locally, and they were all done by Bob Ross when he was at Eelson Air Force Base in the 70s. We have two Northern Lights paintings. This one is specifically a commission of a cabin that the guest parents encountered. And then we have some very similar mountain scenes. Taking a close look at the stretcher stamps, we can see... On the stretcher stamps that all of your paintings have, which is how we know these are his from the 70s, he calls them Alaskan oil paintings because that's what they were back in the day. For paintings bought for 12 and $5 in the current marketplace, Bob Ross paintings like this would sell for... On the fifteen dollars to $25,000 range. Oh my gosh. Wow. How much really? did you guys pay? <laughs> Guest brought a baseball player's companion of 1859. Her husband paid for a storage locker, and there were a lot of books there. The storage locker got damaged, but the book survived. The book is considered by historians and baseball enthusiasts as the most important old baseball book. It was carried by players in their pocket while playing in that era. The book gives details about the rules and regulations of baseball. It also describes the different rules by different cities that play the sport. An example is the New York rules that helped it become the epic center of baseball in the 1950s. At auction, despite the water damage, the book is estimated to be worth four to six thousand dollars. <laughs> That's amazing! <laughs> Here we have a unique piece, a print, or possibly a drawing. The guest father, a dentist from the Schultz family, likely received the artwork in the early 1950s. It is identified as a strip created by Charles Schultz, better known by his nickname, Sparky. Sparky was Charles Schultz's nickname. Right, there you go. And, and Schultz was one of the most famous natives of Minnesota. It ran from 1947 to 1950 in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, predating the world-famous Peanuts comic strip. Schultz attempted national syndication in 1948, but the deal fell through leading to the cancellation of this particular strip in early 1950. Penis, however, would debut later that same year. This artwork held immense significance, a precursor to the beloved Penis characters. The great part about this is it's been hidden away for all of these years. For all intents and purposes, nobody even knows this piece still exists. An inscription from Sparky to the guest's father added a personal touch, considering its strength. The appraiser declared its value to be... Uh, I would probably place a, an estimate on this at auction somewhere around $18,000 to $24,000. All right. The guest explains that the painting was a gift to her husband, who was the dean of the graduate school at Ohio State University in the 1960s. He did a favor for the growing East Asia Studies Department, and as a thank you, they gave him this painting. The painting is by the Chinese artist Hong John V who was born near Gangzhou province in 1890 and died in 1991. He lived in China for many years, but moved to Taiwan in 1949 when Madame Chiang Kai-shek moved there. Huang John V was a famous landscape painter, and the painting is done in the typical Chinese style of ink on paper. As a typical Chinese painting, it's ink on paper, and there is a bit of color by the waterfall here and on the man's robe down here. And those could have been a bit more brilliant to begin with and could have faded a bit over time. The colors may have faded a bit over time. There is an inscription on the painting that translates to, the flying stream falls directly down 3,000 feet. Now, this poem is part of a poem that was written by the 8th century Tang Dynasty, Chinese poet Li Bo. The painting is dated to the year 1969, based on the Chinese 16-year cycle. This painting is a bit more sparse than some of his other works. It would still carry a pre-sale estimate of... At auction, 
it would undoubtedly carry a pre-sale estimate of $8,000 to $12,000. Very interesting. We have a magnificent brooch belonging to our guest who collects them. Passed down in the family from her grandmother, it has turned into a cherished family heirloom. She was a farmer's wife, but, you know, got dressed up in the evening, that sort of thing. The brooch dates from the 1930s, from the Art Deco era. With a theatrical sense about it, this piece was made to dazzle and stand out. The diamonds are cut in a modern, brilliant style. Due to the symmetry of the cut, you can see the beautiful sparkle at the corner of it. Bold brooches like this can be taken apart. But unusually, this is one bold brooch. Let's hear what the appraiser has to say. Set in white gold. It's got a yellow gold back to it, mm -hmm. but white gold at the top to, again, help to really reflect those diamonds. Okay. So it's absolutely wonderful. Adorned with 14-karat diamonds, it's truly a stunning piece. In an auction, the current price of this piece would be £20,000. Oh, my goodness. It's <laughs> 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 taking my breath away, that one. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, crumbs. Brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> This guest brought an art sculpture of Roots, which he purchased from the garage of a home sale. It is a piece of folk art with an incredible appeal traced to 1890 or 1900. It has spooky tree designs around it. The sculpture looks fascinating and mysterious. Several designs of snakes, cats, and birds are on the tree. The sculpture is estimated to be valued between thirty dollars to $50,000. That's incredible. <laughs> That's um, early welcome news. That's unbelievable. This beautiful drawer is not as simple as you might think it is. The guest got it six years ago in Stowe and was surprised when he got home. I bought it six years ago uh, in Stowe and I was a little concerned when I got it home to notice that the drawer seemed to be made out of recycled pieces of timber. On closer examination, the appraiser eliminates all doubts. Well, let me allay your fears first of all. There's nothing wrong with this. These pieces of furniture, particularly in the country, are made on large estates. Usually, they would have stored wood, not used it, and kept it in the workshop. This wood was originally prepared for paneling in a room. These panels are from the 19th century, making it around 150 years old. This piece is unique in that the painting is still very much preserved. As pure as this, this is like the day it was painted. Here you can see the thickness. It's, all, it's a sort of tempera. It's, it's a wonderful texture. It is an absolutely stylized Tudor rose, and this is almost a guilloche molding, a banding pattern. For a chest that was bought for 1,000 pounds, it's currently valued at... Certainly uh, improved on that in six years, but these are, these are bonuses. I suppose that panel is worth about a thousand pounds. And that one a thousand pounds. It surprised me. It's very exciting. Very exciting. The fascinating tale of Anna Smith, a painting with a rich maritime history, is passed down through generations. The Anna Smith finds its origin in the talented hands of Seth Whipple, a Michigan native and renowned Great Lakes artist born in 1855. Painted in 1887, this masterpiece captures the essence of a bygone era, symbolizing the transition from sail to steam power in maritime transportation. Whipple's attention to detail is evident at every brushstroke. Love the wonderful low horizon line. Right. Uh, I love the power of the tugboat coming forward, the drama in the sky. But Anna Smith isn't just a work of art. It's a testament to the legacy of the Parker Transport Company and the craftsmanship of its builders. Tragically, Anna Smith met its demise in 1898, but its memory lives on through this painting. Despite the challenges of time, including a notable hole in the canvas, its value remains undiminished. In this condition, the auction value would be somewhere between... The auction value would be somewhere between ten dollars and $15,000. Oh, wow! That is awesome. <laughs> Guest explains that the painting is by Francois Gillot, known for being a mistress of Picasso and the mother of Paloma Picasso. Acquired at a PBS auction around 35 to 40 years ago, the painting is signed F. Gillot and has a gallery label from Dalzell Hatfield, a Los Angeles gallery with the title Yellow Flower.
Born in 1921, Francois Gillot was introduced to art by her mother, who taught her painting, but not drawing. And she taught her daughter that if you made a mistake in an artwork, you should just incorporate the mistake and make that as part of the artwork. Gillot met Picasso at 21, living with him from 1944 to 1953. Later, she married Jonas Salk, the vaccine pioneer. The painting reflects Picasso's abstracted Cubist influence, but with more organic lines. And later on, she kind of developed her own style. There's renewed interest in Gillot's work, with recent sales fetching over half a million dollars. The appraiser suggests the painting might sell for as much as... In a retail gallery, it might sell for as much as 20000 Really? Oh, you're kidding. Medals are priceless tokens of valor, each one telling a story of extraordinary courage and selflessness. Take, for instance, the Carnegie Medal awarded to the guest grandfather. Edward Malloy, a humble hero whose daring rescue of an 18-month-old baby from a well in 1927 captured hearts and inspired all. Despite the imminent danger and uncertainty, Malloy risked his life without hesitation, embodying the true spirit of heroism. Andrew Carnegie has known it by many faces. Of course, he was a steel magnate. He came over from Scotland, made his fortune. He was also considered by some to be one of the major members of the Gilded Age. Between 1904 and 2014, the Carnegie Foundation honored 9,600 individuals with medals for their acts of heroism, alongside providing over $35 million in grants. Inscribed with the phrase, Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. The bronze medal serves as a poignant tribute to his selflessness. While its monetary value may be estimated at around $4,000, the true worth of this medal transcends material wealth. The guest shares the story of finding the painting at a local goodwill with his wife, drawn to its beauty and quality despite knowing little about it. Priced at $4.99, he decided to purchase it. The appraiser introduces John Baldessari as one of the most important living contemporary artists. Probably one of the most important living contemporary artists. He was profoundly influential on several generations of young artists who are working today. Born and raised in National City, California, he famously declared in 1971 that he would no longer make boring art. The painting, titled Signed for Rothko and Albers, is from Baldessari's early period, a time when he destroyed much of his work before transitioning to more conceptual pieces. The painting's title references Mark Rothko and Joseph Albers, two influential painters. Appraiser notes that Baldessari painted this piece himself. And he had a very famous show in 1968 where he hired a sign painter to simply paint the artworks for him. This shift was a significant concept in the art world, emphasizing the idea behind the art rather than the physical act of painting. The painting is oil on canvas, rare for Baldessari's later works. Label on the back indicates it could be rented for $3 a month from the La Jolla Museum of Art, with the option to buy after a year. The appraiser estimates its current retail replacement value at about... Today, I would put a retail replacement value of about $90,000. Wow. Oh, that's great. The guest brought a Rolex Double Red. Rolex is a household luxury watch brand. The brother who was working in Dubai in the 1970s gave it to him. It is a Rolex 1665, called a Golden Double Red, Sea Dweller Submariner. The Rolex is highly sought after by collectors. It is inspired by the oil rigging and depth of the oil fields in the Middle East and built with ilium for protection of the watch. The watch has all the original strap and buildup. The original date the watch was made is on the strap. The Rolex is valued at 35,000 pounds or more. <laughs> 35,000. That's amazing. This man brought Harry S. Truman Archive, retrieved in 1955. His father was the chairman of the Truman Library section in the early 50s. Harry Truman was the former vice president and 33rd president of the United States. The archives include correspondences, images of his father, and Truman. The letters include appreciation of his father's efforts by Truman and communications regarding donations to the Presidential Library. 
It also features an autographed letter from the guest to Harry Truman as a memoir of Truman, which was signed to his father. The entire archive is valued between eight to ten thousand dollars. The guest had little information about the fabric's origin, but believed it might be connected to the Wright Flyer. The guest brought in a framed piece of fabric, a cherished family heirloom passed down by their grandfather, Maurice H. Smith. It was confirmed that the fabric was indeed a genuine swatch from the wing of the Wright Flyer, one of several created after Orville Wright's death. These commemorative pieces were cut from the original fabric and presented with a certificate signed by Lester Gardner, a close friend of the Wright brothers and a significant figure in early aviation history. While the exact number of these collectibles remained unknown, their historical significance was undeniable. Taking into account the fabric's authenticity, its connection to the Wright Flyer, and Lester Gardner's signature, the retail value on this piece is... I would put an auction estimate on this of $8,000 to $10,000. Wow. The woman brought an ingenious mechanical chess set. It belonged to her grandfather who played with it after the Second World War. There are unique knots and bolts. The pieces look like they were crafted by artists, and the carrying box is impressive. It has legs to make it a low-level table. The chess set is accompanied by the military medal of the guest grandfather who made the chess set. At auction, the chess set is valued at 500 pounds. I think someone will get 500 pounds for that. This woman brought a Steuben hunting scene vase, circa 1930. Her father bought it and gave it to her. It was made by Frederick Carter, who came to the United States in 1903. This particular piece is a cased piece, and it is mirrored black over an alabaster lead vase, which is called the Honey Man. It always takes Frederick Carter over a year before he would produce any of his work. It's the kind of vase that men will covet, with several animals around it. The value of the vase is somewhere between $3,500 to $5,000. <laughs> wow. The magnificent item you see here is a whiskey chest that belonged to the great-grandfather of the husband of the guest, Richard W. Manson. The guest came to know so much about the item because she was close to the grandmother of her husband, Sally. Sally told me that her father, Richard Manson, had served in the Civil War. He was a courier for Robert E. Lee's son, who was captured. Can you guess the age of this chest? Well, I have to say, when he acquired it, it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50 years old already. It can also be referred to as a bottle case and is typical of southern furniture. What made the item so cool is that the bottle itself fits into the chest. The fact that you have original bottles from the case adds to its interest a little bit. The secondary wood, which makes up the drawers inside, is southern white pine, indicating its Virginia origin. The locks on the inside have been changed. Those who collect pieces of furniture like this would love that it is small and that it's from the South. The strong provenance of this item comes from the guest being a direct descendant of someone who was in close contact with Lee, adding significant value to the item. If placed in an auction, the value of this item would undoubtedly amaze you. I think in an auction, it would probably bring somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six thousand dollars. Yeah. Sidonia Klein Goldman, the guest's husband's grandmother, was a gifted artist who expressed her talent through china painting. Unlike many who decorated practical objects like plates and vases, Sidonia created her works on porcelain plaques specifically designed for wall display. Her skills surpassed those of mere hobbyists, placing her among the truly talented china painters of her time. There are two contrasting plaques by Sidonia. One, depicting a scene with monks and vegetables, showcased her technical ability. However, the less popular subject matter and the unfortunate scratches caused by years of use as a key dish significantly reduced its value. In contrast, the plaque featuring two little boys was a more desired theme and remained in excellent condition. This plaque, a testament to Sidonia's artistic skill and featuring a universally beloved subject, holds a retail value of... I would say a retail value would be between $400 and $600. Oh, it's, it's really, really nice. I, I cannot believe that. But the monks, the combination of the subject matter, which is not as desirable, and the scratches, a retail value might be 
a retail value might be as little as $100 to $200, uh, just uh, a little bit, but yeah. it, it would, might be hard to sell. This woman brought a diamond sautar necklace and earrings from 1905. The necklace was given to her grandmother with a picture of her wearing it. The necklace looks shorter from when it was worn by the guest grandmother. The removed pieces were used to make earrings. The metal is platinum, and there are cuts of diamonds which are mostly European cuts, and the center has two carats worth diamond. The estimated value of the necklace and the earrings together is twenty to $30,000. That's nice. <laughs> this quilt was designed by the guest's mother and father-in-law who wanted to participate in the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. 33, the theme was the century of progress. The appraiser described the quilt's design, noting that each square was intended to represent an old and a new concept. The central piece depicted a 1930s woman surrounded by portraits of notable figures such as Edison, Abraham Lincoln, FDR, and Lindbergh. The outer border of the quilt showcased the names of inventors, scientists, and individuals who influenced industry and scientific discovery during that century. Despite not winning or meeting the contest deadline, the quilt's design was praised for its sophistication and thoughtfulness. For replacement value, the appraiser estimated the quilt's worth at replacement value, I would place $12,000 replacement value on this. Right. The guest brought this picture, two caps and medals of a local hero. Joseph Eric Stevenson is a legend in the 1930s who played for Leeds. He was the great-grandfather of the guest and lived locally in Leeds. Joseph also had an active military career when World War II broke out and died in action in 1944. The family has no intention of selling the picture and the medals. The two England caps are worth 12 to 1,500 pounds. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The guest presents stunning works of art in the form of a necklace and two bracelets, purchased by the guest's father. The necklace is an Etruscan revival, heavily influenced by ancient Greek religion, and it's a replica of an ancient necklace. The necklace is what we call Etruscan revival, and this is a copy of an ancient necklace made probably in England or in Italy about 1870. Made with coral from the Mediterranean, it was crafted using 18 karat gold. It has coral from the Mediterranean, very beautiful, almost angel skin coral, and 18 karat gold. A bracelet shaped like a serpent with small diamond eyes woven around a steel core that runs through it, enchanting the soul. The third piece is a gold ankle bracelet adorned with a series of figures that is a symbol of elegance and grace. Both bracelets were intricately designed to reflect the sophistication and refinement of the Victorian era. And these items, each serving as timeless treasures, reflect the romanticism and charm of a bygone era, and at auction would fetch... This Victorian Etruscan Revival necklace would bring about $15,000. Serpent bracelets sell in good antique shops for approximately $7,500. Syrian Revival bangle is also a $15,000. A dining room table that brings back memories. The George Nakashima walnut table has been in the guest family living room for over 58 years. It was bought by his parents in 1963 for $150. This table, which is made by George Nakashima, has some classic Nakashima features, its free edges and butterfly design. These greatly add to its value. Also, Nakashima's furniture is very easy to repair. That's the other thing. He used a really simple oil finish. So if you want to get it redone, it will not hurt the value... The collection environment for Nakashima furniture is worldwide, and it keeps on growing. Yeah, and it surprises me. Usually there's a lifespan to these things, but Nakashima has uh, outlived the lifespan that I, that I thought possible. The table, which is still in good condition, has the appraiser valuing it at about... I would say in the condition that it's in today, it's probably worth, at auction, eight to $12,000. Uh, and I suspect fair. that that's probably a conservative value. That's very nice to hear. Craftsmanship and poetry unite in this item, where glass is sculptured into elegance and cultural legacy. The guest inherited it from her mother. This item is a European glass art house vase made circa 1900s. Although unmarked, this vase was likely crafted by a company called Palm Koenig. 
made, although it's not marked, by a company called Palma Koenig. Renowned for their superb craftsmanship in vase making. Adorning the glass is a colorful floral design, and it has been exceptionally well maintained considering its age. A vintage, intricately designed vase like this one certainly catches the eye. And at auction, it would likely be valued around... Conservative retail estimate would be between $1,000 and $1,500. Oh, okay. Okay? Mm -hmm, that's fine. The guest brought a 1932 Percy Gray watercolor, which she inherited from her father. Percy Gray is a painter from San Francisco who loved painting the beautiful California landscapes. This painting is one of the largest of his works. The watercolor painting is 30 inches and about 22 inches wide, with color blue in the water painting and signed by Percy Gray. The watercolor painting is valued at $25,000 to $35,000 or more. Oh my, oh, that's great. Oh. In the thrift store's fine arts section, the guest discovered a piece they instantly loved. They've carried it from house to house ever since. The guest bought it for the amount of $2.52. Painting with Crayon by Earl Kirkham, year 1950, showcases his unique style and material experimentation. His signature is in the top right. This piece likely reflects Kirkham's innovative abstract expressionist style. It's oil on board, but the lines are drawn with crayon on top of the paint. He stuck with Cezanne and Cubism, steering clear of the abstract expressionist movement embraced by others. Crayons offer a departure, inviting exploration of their tactile qualities and bold colors. Painting with crayon reflects Kirkham's innovative spirit and commitment to artistic boundaries. The painting's mysteries spoke softly through its hues as the appraiser assessed its worth. I would expect you to get somewhere around about $1,500 to $2,500. Okay. Buddy Ebsen is an American actor and dancer. He is known for playing the character Jed Clampett in the TV show The Beverly Hillbillies. These items were his dancing shoes and, in fact, his all-day shoes. The guest had all of his collections and clothes, and she came to know how much to insure them for. The guest is Dorothy Ebsen, Buddy Ebsen's wife. I was married to him. You were married to him. Yes. And these came directly from him. There's been no break in ownership, so that gives us absolutely impeccable provenance. For those who never missed an episode of the Beverly Hillbillies, one look at these will definitely take you down memory lane. An iconic piece of Hollywood memorabilia from that time period. Buddy Ebsen began dancing in the 20s when he danced in vaudeville Ziegfeld Follies in these shoes. So these shoes are very important in the history of Hollywood. If these items are put out in auction, you'll be surprised how much the value will be. I wouldn't insure them for anything less than $20,000. Uh, for the two pair of shoes. The guest brought a treasure trove of memorabilia from their time as a press officer in the Kennedy administration. Among the collection were several intriguing items, but the appraiser's keen eye gravitated towards a set of three speech transcripts. These transcripts, unlike many signed copies that circulated, were riddled with edits in Kennedy's own handwriting. This detail offered a rare glimpse into the president's thought process and the meticulous crafting of his speeches. It wasn't just the content of the speeches themselves, but the revisions and annotations that provided scholars and historians with valuable insights. The significance of the collection extended beyond these annotated speeches. Drafts like the one for the Amherst College Address, delivered shortly before the president's assassination, added another layer to the historical narrative. Furthermore, the seemingly mundane press manifest from the 1963 Dallas trip with its scheduled arrival time for a luncheon that Kennedy tragically never attended. The true worth of the collection stemmed from its ability to weave together these various elements, creating a more complete understanding of a significant moment in history. Taken individually, the items held value, but as a whole, they transcended the sum of their parts. Recognizing this, the estimated value of the collection is... My conservative view would be, at, at this juncture, it would have an auction estimate of sixty dollars to $80,000. Wow. Our guest recounts finding the pottery at a local Goodwill with his wife, recognizing its beauty and quality despite knowing nothing about it. Priced at $4.99, he decided to purchase it. The appraiser explains that the Overbeck pottery is from Indiana, created by four sisters. This piece is marked OBK for Overbeck, with the sisters' initials E and F incised into the surface. 
The pottery reflects the arts and crafts period, particularly the late teens and early 1920s. Arts and crafts influence, and this falls into that power alley. This design technique distills the original design from geometric forms, evident in the repeated geometric depiction of a man in a striped suit with a pink sun and tree behind him. The appraiser praises the technical achievement of the pottery, noting its even firing on all sides. He estimates its value at auction to be between... The auction, it would bring somewhere between fifty dollars and $100,000. can't believe that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a seriously, seriously good piece of overback. The timepiece had belonged to her great-great-grandfather, bearing the initials H.O.B. Sr. and the date 1848. Following in succession, the initials of her grandfather, H.O.B. Jr., and then her father, H.O.B. III, were also engraved on it. The William Forbes Silver Can, crafted in New York City, is a stunning example of American silverwork. Its design, often described as cartouche form, reflects the exquisite craftsmanship of the era. It features a lovely scroll handle, intricate chased, and bright colored decoration. Upon flipping it over, one can spot the hallmark of Ball, Tompkins, and Black, a distinguished American silver manufacturer from New York. Below the initial set of hallmarks on the can, there are additional markings indicating the work of William Forbes, a prominent New York silver maker. Mr. Forbes enjoyed widespread recognition for his craftsmanship in the industry. The appraiser values the Williams Forbes silver can. An auction value on this can would be approximately $1,000 to $1,500. Very nice. It's amazing how much they knew about the earth in 1828, which is when these globes were dated. One globe is celestial and the other is terrestrial, and they are two wonderful pieces of library furniture. They actually belong to the guest father-in-law. They actually belong to uh, my father-in-law, who thinks his father bought them uh, 40, 50 years ago. The pair of globes are still on their original or contemporary stands. An interesting fact about the globes is the labels were printed and brought up to date in 1828. Underneath, there's a little slip, which appears as if it's been torn away, and it says 1816. They are in a circular frame which is actually rosewood, but the legs are actually beech and painted to simulate rosewood. The appraiser dives in a bit more about the woodwork of the globes. So much so that when we come back up to the apron here, you can see where the marking wasn't quite strong enough in the rosewood, they actually encouraged it and improved it with a bit of paint as well. And yes, there is a boxwood stringing all the way around. It's a good piece of furniture and then topped with these wonderful globes. It's no surprise that they are currently worth 30,000 pounds. Oh, great. They'll have a heart attack. <laughs> in the world of luxury, few adornments rival the allure of a piece cast in the warm glow of yellow gold, a symbol of timeless refinement. This guest showcases a yellow gold Cartier pin gifted by her husband. The item is made with 18 carats gold. Although this piece resembles a safety pin, it is much more than that. At both ends of the pin feature blue stones inlaid, cut from lapis in a high dome fashion. Upon a closer inspection of one end, there's a tiny hallmark resembling an eagle's head, indicating its origin from France. Design-wise, this item hails from the 1940s. On the inside, there's a sign indicating it was made by Cartier, along with a visible serial number authenticating its originality. There's tiny little numbers, there's five numbers. That's very important when trying to authenticate Cartier pieces. A finely preserved Cartier creation, both authentic and rare, making its value at auction to be around... I would say at auction, $6,000 to $8,000. You're kidding. This watch, along with its matching Chatelaine, was a cherished piece in the guest grandmother's antique shop. It was kept safe by her husband Ernie, the watchmaker and tinkerer. Admired for its exquisite craftsmanship, the watch dates back to as early as 1780 and possibly as late as 1820. It's a men's dress pocket watch, reserved for the grandest occasions, adorned with shag green on the back and embellished with seed pearls and guilloche enamel. What they did was they engraved on the gold a kind of a, uh, a wiggling pattern and then uh, covered it with the enamel. 
The Chatelaine is a rare find to accompany the watch, and it attaches securely to the waistband, completing the elegant ensemble. The appraiser, while admiring its condition and matching accessories, values the watch and Chatelaine combination at about $7,500. But on a good day, because of its condition and things, it could bring a price a little higher. The guest purchased the table from a friend for $350 and later discovered that the emblem on it belonged to the Automobile Club de France de Le Quest. The table features a late Victorian-style base made of cast iron. This is cast iron, and here is this mark, General Toulouse. Highlight of the table is the Intaglio Pietra Dura inlaid marble top, which is the real art piece of the table. The appraiser knows that the table was likely made around 1906. Current market for automobilia is very strong, mirroring the hot car market. As such, the appraiser estimates that the table could easily fetch but I would put an auction estimate on this, easily uh, $6,000 to $12,000. Guest inherited a cherished sewing box from her late mother, a unique piece made for her grandmother in England. It's of English origin, dating it to the early 1870s. The box's design features intricate marquetry, depicting sailing vessels and steamships. Each side showcases meticulous craftsmanship, including a paddle steamer, a heart-shaped accretion, and a full-sail vessel. Top of the box displays a beautifully rendered scene with a lighthouse showcasing the original finish and warm patina. A very interesting variety of exotic woods. See a burl walnut and that looks like cherry and contrasting lighter fruit woods. Opening the box reveals a compartmentalized interior with colorful inlaid flags and family memorabilia. It is described as a treasure box filled with fascinating tidbits and memories. Sailor-made items and marine art contribute to its value. That its value would be, well, somewhere probably in the three to five thousand dollar range. The value of this folk art has dipped, now ranging from fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars. These books belonged to the guest's father and are an impressive selection by the renowned 18th century Italian printmaker Giovanni Paranisi. Par he collected all sorts of encyclopedias, different kinds of books like these books, uh -huh. and amassed a very large library. Paranisi was a significant figure in Italian architectural paintmaking and moved to Rome in 1740 to study under the famous Giuseppe Vasi. This is a portrait of Piranesi issued just shortly after his death. The appraiser highlighted the significance of Paranasi's work, particularly his portrayal of Roman architecture and exploration of its origins in Etruscan influence. This work is done from Paranisi's book Magnificent where he tried to prove that Roman architecture did not come from the Greeks, but actually was inspired by the Etruscans. Despite some common wear and tear, the set was in remarkable condition. The condition of the volumes is amazing, really in extraordinary condition. And you have a total of 330 plates by Piranesi, which is an enormous number. Recognizing their rarity, condition, and historical significance, the appraiser estimated the aggregate auction value for the collection to be between... I think the aggregate auction value for the whole collection would be in the range of fifty to $70,000. Thank you, Dad! <laughs> this guest brought a Bennington Pottery Lion, curated in 1850. It has been in the family of the guest since the time of his great-grandfather. Underneath the pottery is the mark, Fenton, Lyman & Company, who were actually makers of pottery in 1849 in Bennington. They made lead-glazed animal pottery. On the pottery is clay-induced technique, known as technique coleslaw. It was in high demands in the 1920s and was made from Paris, which means it has another pair. This pottery lion is valued at four to $8,000. Ouch. <laughs> so is it going on the piano or is it going back in the closet? I'm afraid it's gonna go back into the closet. Costumes and set designs serve as more than just outfits for characters. They act as portals, transporting individuals into the heart of the narrative. Today's guest presents drawings of iconic costumes and set designs. These costume design and set designs were crafted by Roger K. Furse, an English painter known for his work as a costume and production designer in both stage and film. He received an Academy Award in 1948 for costume design. This particular piece is from a 1955 production of Macbeth. 
And in this production of Macbeth in 1955, Olivier got so much acclaim for his role and his depiction of Macbeth that all the other characters... The costume design depicts a male character named Olivier, whom first intended to exude an aura of strength and brutal violence, achieved through the use of tweeds and heavy masculine fabrics. On the other hand, the set designs convey a sense of impending doom and an eerie atmosphere, employing stark lighting and minimal architectural details. In terms of value, these remarkable items truly showcase exceptional design skills and are in pristine condition, likely commanding an auction price of... So I think this might be worth eight to twelve hundred. Oh, great. And Fabulous. how much did you pay for the two? Seventy-five dollars. Very good. And I think this might be at least six to eight hundred. Fabulous. Wow, great. Thank you. The guest's garage sale adventure yielded a hidden gem, a beautiful yet asymmetrical sumac rug. With a keen eye for design, the guest had snagged this unique piece for a mere $250 from a professor who was downsizing. The rug has lots of potential, identified as a Caucasian sumac rug, crafted using an intricate chain stitch technique. Sumac rugs originated in the Caucasus region in the late 19th century and continue to be produced today. One of the most striking features of the rug was its lack of symmetry in the medallion design. While some might prefer a more balanced design, the asymmetry in this rug spoke to the creativity and individuality of the weavers. However, focusing on the quality and craftsmanship evident throughout the rug and the current condition, the rug holds a significant value of... We could very realistically say that this would have a retail value of $15,000 after restoration. This guest brought a Fayence Manufacturing Company vase of 1886. It was given to her by her boyfriend's stepfather, which he inherited from his first wife. It is an aesthetic Japanese pottery with intricate designs. Though it was made in the United States, New York precisely, it has nice flowers and butterfly designs across the body with a nice articulate buildup to the top. It has the maker's mark right at the bottom. This vase is worth between fifteen and twenty-five hundred dollars. Oh, and the engineer uh, going to be and happy. Wow. So that's what's happening to Fayance Manufacturing Company. The value is going up. Great. This guest brought America's Great Fires lithograph, believed to be made in 1905. She got it from her mother, which has passed down from the family. It was originally gold-colored, but it was stove blackened by the frame. The center fire in the picture is from Baltimore. Only one of such prints have been seen by the appraiser in 30 years. It includes the number of people who died and the dollar amount that was lost. It also features San Francisco Fire of 1857 and other details. The value is estimated at twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. Wow! Thank you. This German Father Christmas figure was discovered by the guest's grandfather while doing repairs in the attic of an old home purchased in the 1940s. Despite attempting to return it to the original owner, who denied any knowledge of it, the figure remained in the family. The appraiser noted that the figure's dates back to around 1910. It was in excellent condition, with only slight discoloration on the face. Leaving the guest a delightful surprise, its retail value was estimated to be between... He has a retail value of $2,000 to $2,500. Wow, wonderful! <laughs> A teapot so beautifully decorated, it is guaranteed to brighten sore eyes. The English creamware teapot, which dates to 1770, has no significant markings to determine its maker and year of production. The exact year and the maker doesn't affect the value that much. The heart-shaped design and strapped handle contribute strongly to its value. It's valued at... I think in today's market, a retail value on this pot would be somewhere between two and three thousand dollars. Okay, that's great. I'm just thrilled to have it. I'm, it's not going anywhere. This guest brought a Philibert Leon Courtier oil painting of 1875, which she inherited from her uncle. The painting is believed to be a painting of an Aesop's fable story of Belling the Cat. It featured the mice trying to get rid of the cat, but no one wants to execute the plan who also signed on the oil painting. Courtier works around that era, like this, is a critic of politicians. They have great ideas, but they can't really follow through and nobody really wants to do them. This sneaker is worth between three and five thousand dollars.
This unique glass necklace was made by the French jeweler Georges Fouquet. Fouquet came from a family of jewelers, and he is best known for his Art Nouveau creations. The necklace is made of frosted glass. You know, these are diamonds. I uh, thought maybe they yeah, might they be. Yeah, they were diamonds. The metal could be white gold, doesn't necessarily have to be platinum. It's also been shortened to make some earrings. We add up the glass and the few diamonds. Doesn't amount to much, but this is where design is everything. The appraiser values it at... I'm going to say conservatively ten to $15,000. As of 2019... The value rose to about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. My gracious! <laughs> yeah. So, what do you think? A nice piece of glass, huh? Oh, it is a nice piece of glass. I think today it could be valued between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. What do you think? Let us know in the comment section. The guest brought a view of Des Moines print of eighteen fifty, which she bought from a home sale thirty-seven years ago. Some of the stories of Des Moines are highlighted in the picture, including the early settlers to the town like Kalanans. The art is created and authenticated by a local artist, W.H. Wheeler, and this particular lithograph is listed in a reference book, Views and Viewmakers. The print is the first bird-eye view of Des Moines. The retail price is worth between three and $4,000. Oh, uh, there are people oh, that would lovely. certainly pay that. Yeah. Wonderful. This book belonged to Guest's uncle, who was an artist and a graduate of the Chicago Art Institute. The appraiser identified the book as a series of periodicals titled 291, famously associated with Alfred Staglitz's photographic studio in New York. Published between 1915 and 1916, the 12 issues represented the birth of modernism and avant-garde in America. The magazine was initially intended as a complete 12-issue run, with limited editions of 1,100 copies, including 100 printed on vellum and the remainder on paper. Despite its significance, the magazine was a financial disaster for Stilgus, with most of the print run sold off cheaply. The appraiser noted that complete magazine sets are rare in the market, and in the condition presented, they could fetch... ...at retail approximately $25,000. Wow. This dry point was painted by Picasso in 1909. In the 1950s, the owner's father bought it from an art gallery in New York for just a few hundred dollars. The owner has loved this print since childhood. So I took it with me, and then I came back, and then I got sent to Europe for a couple of years. So I took it with me there. Picasso, along with Brock, were pioneers of cubism in art. Picasso made rare prints like this one in his 20s. It's actually a very scarce Picasso print. It dates from 1909, and it's a dry point. Picasso scratched a design with a needle into a copper plate, inked it, placed paper over it, and pressed. He used to sign each print with pencil, like this in his early career. Over the years, dirt and sunlight have darkened this piece of art. By cleaning it professionally, its estimated value can be between ten dollars to $15,000. <laughs> wow. The 18th century religious sermon book is a priceless find handed down to me from a family member. I've had it in my possession about 20 years. It was printed in Philadelphia in 1731. It was printed by the famous printer, Benjamin Franklin. This book is a very rare find and has traveled through centuries. It is in a typical calf binding of its era. While other books show browned and brittle pages, this one is still in good condition. Its value at an auction can be between twelve to $18,000. <laughs> well, so that, I don't know, it was worth protecting and keeping it on your shelves. Oh, it's great. It's a great book. The sword belongs to the guest great-great-grandfather. The artilleryman's saber was utilized by artillery officers during the mid-19th century. Joseph C. Bragg was an inspector for the U.S. government from 1841 to 1849. The initials that are beside the 1843 production date are JCB. And that's for Joseph C. Bragg. The sword's intricate design showcases the skill and craftsmanship of Nathan P. Ames. The sturdy leather belt, adorned with regal insignia and buckles. The scabbard is made of buff leather. These items represent power, honor, and strength. The sword, the scabbard, and the belt value between... 3000 and 3500 Wow, that's amazing. That's great. 
the princess cup from her husband's aunt. Referred to as a zarf, an Ottoman coffee glass holder, it's crafted from 18 karat gold. Enameled and adorned with old mine cut diamonds, it's likely dating to the late 19th century during the Ottoman Empire as a coffee holder. These ornate objects were often seen as a symbol of status and were sometimes gifted to courts and high status individuals. The Zarf Cup is valued between three to five thousand dollars. I'm really surprised, and Pat would be so happy. This man brought a British 125th Regimental Officer's coat, believed to be from 1795. It was predominant in the Revolutionary War period. It is also accompanied by the breeches, which has been cut to preserve it. It is an officer's coat from the 125th Regiment, which only existed from 1794 to 1796. The brass buttons were formerly gold. A closer look at the arms also show the cuffs and lace, and a spin-around revealed details of the false pockets. Finally, it has a Stanford Regiment logo. The coat is worth between seven and $9,000. The appraiser explains that the first Tarzan book was published in Chicago in 1914 by McClurg. The ownership of the publishers who handled Tarzan changed frequently over the years. Estimated auction value for these whole Tarzan book collection to be between... I would put on the whole collection a value of $1,000 to $1,500. Oh, wonderful. The appraiser identifies the item as a World War I bomb site manufactured by the Edison Company. Before such devices were available, pilots had to estimate their targets, making bombing accuracy difficult. The appraiser mentions that the bomb site was used to compensate for wind speed. Estimated auction value for the World War I bomb site is between $1,500 and $2,500. The guest inherited these jewels from her great aunt in 2004, who left a note saying, Please enjoy these, and then give them to your daughter. The guest was overwhelmed when she received them and finds them to be really beautiful. These jewelry pieces are from the Art Deco period, which is one of the most exciting periods in jewelry history. They date back to roughly 1930 and feature diamonds, sapphires, and platinum, which was the metal of choice for the era. The Art Deco style is characterized by geometric shapes, straight lines, clean finishes, and sharp color contrasts. The center diamond in the ring is just over two carats. Center diamond in the fringe is just over two carats and is a very nice stone. Very nice stone. Wow. And it's beautifully displayed. The sapphires in the jewelry have a differential cut, which is an unusual cutting style that adds to their appeal. This and very sharp color contrasts. And both of these pieces exhibit those elements beautifully. This bracelet is a belly style bracelet, wider in the middle and tapering towards the ends. Graduation from the middle to the ends is brilliantly done. So with that said, would you have any idea as to what the value of these pieces might be? In today's auction market, these pieces as a suite could fetch a pre-sale auction estimate of... Together. Together. They would have a pre-sale auction estimate of fifteen to $20,000. My! <laughs> The epitome of refinement and style, embodied in this stunning rosewood cabinet, is absolutely captivating. This piece of furniture was brought under the show by the guest, and it used to be in a house the guest's parents purchased in 1963. When the house was purchased, this piece, along with other furniture, came along with it. Interestingly, this furniture passed most of the essential quality checks, including its condition, provenance, craftsmanship, and rarity. Furthermore, upon observing this item closely, it is finished on every side, and the rosewood top is inset with a cast brass molding. Also, there is an inlay of mother of pearl and brass set above a floral pewter inlay on top of a single door with an elaborate panel. Additionally, the cabinet's interior is cedar lined, styled graciously in the Napoleon III style, and it was made circa 1800s. It's in the Napoleon III style, or the Empire style, and it's a French cabinet. The unparalleled beauty of this rosewood furniture, its durability, offers us a glimpse of what craftsmanship truly is. And in this very good condition, it would be valued at auction at around... In an auction setting today, we would estimate it at two to $4,000. Wow.
This is a tea set steeped in history and crafted from an unlikely material, melted American silver dollars. The guest explained that the set was a family heirloom commissioned in Paris by his great-grandfather, who was a Confederate sympathizer who had fled the United States during the Civil War. Seeking aid from Napoleon III, the guest's great-grandfather had likely melted down his silver dollars to finance the creation of this exquisite tea set by Odiot. Odiot was one of the most prestigious silversmiths in France. This piece does not just have its historical background, but is also of exceptional quality. The intricate details and superb craftsmanship of the Odiot tea set were evident throughout the design, from the beautiful figure of Neptune perched atop the pitcher to the overall elegance of the sterling silver. The combination of historical significance, artistic merit, and the renown of the maker placed the tea set's value at this kind of history, you're, you're talking somewhere in the area of uh, seventy to $90,000. Wow. A handcrafted carousel model they had purchased for a steal at an antique shop years ago. The carousel, technically a menagerie because it featured a variety of animals beyond horses, had captivated the guests for a long time before they were finally able to afford it. The carousel's maker was identified as Malik, based on historical paperwork that accompanied the piece. Such carousels with various animals were a more sophisticated design compared to those featuring just horses. The craftsmanship of the carousel is very impressive, everything from the carved and painted wooden animals to the intricate fretwork details. A unique element was the clockwork mechanism, likely salvaged from another item, which brought the carousel to life with moving figures like Uncle Sam and the band musicians. The value of the carousel stemmed from its appeal to two distinct audiences, folk art collectors, and carousel collectors. Considering the craftsmanship, the historical context provided by the paperwork, and the dual collector interest, the estimated retail value of the carousel is between... So, I'm going to say retail eight to $12,000. Oh my, thank you. When it comes to furniture, this original piece stands out. It's an occasional table, but a rare one at that. Speaking of quality, the top is veneered in segments of wonderful flame-figured mahogany. Let's take a closer look. See precisely why it's called a flame yes, figure as soon yes. as you look at it. At the back, the back of the leaf is also veneered. Exactly the same way. It's not quite such good veneer. No. It's not quite the, uh, the color and flame uh, figuring of the uh, top surface, but, but it's very, very good. Still... It's supported by these beautifully shaped gates, one at each side. For its origin, it is very, very early Victorian, if not almost late Georgian or William IV. This gadrooning here is still very fine. It's not fat, heavy Victorian gadrooning. The feet are still very nicely carved. You've got the remains of a Regency classical decoration on top of the feet here. For a piece of furniture dated between 1830 and 1840, the appraiser values it at... And my guess is that in a sale, it's going... It's going to make, oh, crumbs, £2,000, possibly more. I think I'd better insure it.